Well, good afternoon, everyone. I guess we'll get started. We have a um, pretty sizable agenda. Um, in case anyone doesn't know me, I'm Kim Shaw, I'm the Environmental Protection Director. Uh, we've been overseeing CARP for the past several years. And Samantha Klein, the Environmental Analyst for the Natural Resources Department has been overseeing this grant from New York State. So without further ado, um, Dan, um, would you wanna introduce the GZA team to everybody? And then we'll let's move on. Thank you, Kim. So uh, my name is Dan Stapleton and I represent a company called GZA Geo Environmental. We're about a 700 person uh, consulting environmental and engineering applied science firm. Um, we're assisting the coastal assessment resiliency plan process with the town and the village. And we have um, two sub consultants working with us on this project. One is Dotson Flinker and you'll be seeing representatives of them today. Um, Dodson and Flinker had performed uh, some significant planning studies for the town in the, in the last few years. And our second um, subconsultant is Coastal Ocean Analytics, which are not with us today. Sam? Yeah. Um, so we wanted to give a brief background on the Coastal Assessment Resiliency Plan Project. It's often abbreviated and referred to as CARP. The town applied for and was awarded a New York State Department of State grant. Rachel Neville is our Department of State point person on the project and she's on this call. Members of the CARP committee are also on this call. They have put significant time into this project over the years and are great assets to its ongoing development. So we just wanted to take the opportunity to say thank you. The goal of CARP is to make recommendations for plans, policies, and procedures to increase our resiliency and adapt to our changing environment. As a coastal community, East Hampton is vulnerable to tidal inundation, shoreline change, and sea level rise. We are developing CARP because we wanna be proactive about mitigating damage that effects that from climate change can cause. This is the third public workshop associated with CARP. The first one was on focus areas in Lazy Point, Cranberry Hole Road, and Gerard Drive and Last Point. The second was on focus areas in Montauk, downtown Montauk, Fort Pond, commercial docks and ditch plains. The presentations from these past two workshops are available on the town website. The consultant team made two videos going over a more in-depth analysis um, for the meeting today. Those will also be available on the town website for public access along with the recording for this meeting. Um, Nate, if you wanna go to the next slide, Throughout the presentation, there are gonna be survey questions for everyone on this call to answer. The survey questions are a good way for us to hear from you guys, get feedback and see what people think. So we encourage you to answer those questions as they come up. Um, I will now turn this over to the experts on the project. Um, so Dan Stapleton, Nate Burgess and Peter Flinker. Thanks, I think I'm taking it for the next couple of slides. Uh, my name is Peter Flinker and I'm as you heard, one of the partners with GZA on the project. Uh, our agenda today is uh, we're going to give a sort of brief introduction to the coastal risks. And as Dan said, there are uh, more extensive videos if you want to see all the details. Uh, then we're going to talk uh, most of our time today about potential strategies. And this includes really building on a lot of the existing strategies that the village already has in place and thinking about how those could be modified and improved. And then we'll just wrap it up with some closing comments. So hoping to do all that the next hour. Uh, next slide, please, Nate. So for those of you who are not that familiar with uh, the Coastal Assessment Resiliency Plan process, uh, these are the goals that the state has put in place really to help the village understand and develop plans for coastal vulnerabilities and incorporate that not just into the, uh, the plans, but also into the decision-making process uh, more completely. Uh, to integrate the principles of coastal resilience into plans, uh, including this plan and, and others. Uh, and through that to facilitate adaptation to changing conditions and preparing for the future, which is this, what this is all about. So that, that involves reducing vulnerability and loss uh, directly, also to facilitating improved resilience. So when there is loss, the village can more easily bounce back. And uh, a big part of that is to identify and implement you know, proactive strategies, uh, not just ways to recover after the fact. And of course, a lot of this is being funded on a state and federal level because 
it's been pretty well documented that, as it says here, one dollar on mitigation saves six dollars in future disaster costs. Uh, next slide, please, Nate. So this plan sort of involves, uh, as as you've heard, a large uh, coastal assessment resiliency planning committee uh, that includes membership from the village of East Hampton. Um, it uh, sort of builds on several other processes, a uh, shoreline change study by Dewberry, a preliminary vulnerability assessment by GEI. GEI. And then uh, what we're ending up with is a uh, extensive CARP plan, uh, which is being headed up by GZA. And you'll see the uh, consulting team listed there. Next one, Nate. So it sort of starts with looking at existing plans. Um, we've done a lot of reading to try to understand what's already in place, including the 18-year-old uh, comprehensive plan, uh, which focused on you know, stewardship, transportation improvements, uh, improvements to facilities and services, and working with um, the town to relieve impacts on the village uh, beaches. As you see there, uh, it also recognizes a lot of the existing programs that are in place, the dune preservation program, coastal hazard, erosion hazard area program in the Atlantic Double Dunes habitat area. So it's been uh, an interesting process and a challenge for us to try to understand, as I said, what's already in place and then try to think about what's working, what's not working and what needs to be improved, which you'll hear about um, more of today. Uh, next slide, please, Nate. And Nate, do you wanna describe uh, the next couple of slides? Sure, <clears throat> can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Um, so in addition to the, that um, local uh, comprehensive plan, there's also recently at the county level, um, the hazard mitigation plan that was prepared um, last year. And, and there are already some priority actions that will help to build um, resilience within the village that have been identified in that hazard mitigation plan, um, including flood protection of the emergency operations center and, and generators for that site. Um, and also some um, 30 of uh, uh, repeat loss or high risk residences that, that should or could be um, elevated, removed or relocated. Um, uh, coastal erosion monitoring, so getting a better handle on, on how the shoreline is changing. And then um, flood protection of, of some limited segments of Route 27. And then at the state level, the Coastal uh, the Community Risk and Resilience Act um, both has provided uh, sort of a, a baseline of data for local communities to use um, to understand sea level rise and climate change in low, medium, high uh, scenarios for, for change. And then in addition to that data, the um, state effort has also generated some important recommendations and guidance for local communities to build resilience into their zoning. One that we'll talk about later as a, a good example is um, there's, there's a pretty clear and detailed recommendation for how to build um, sea level rise into your local flood regulations um, by incorporating the medium sea level rise projection from that state data. We'll talk about that more later. So um, with that, that background, that, that's what we're building off of for the CART project. And first of all, we wanted to get you warmed up with some survey questions just to get a sense of who you are and um, what, what your knowledge is coming to this presentation about the, the risks for and hazards and, and changes that we expect in the village. So um, if you could please respond to these questions, that would be really helpful. We're going to give another 30 seconds for people to finish up answering that. All right, it looks like everybody who's um, not a facilitator has answered, so I'm going to end the poll. It's Dylan. And Nate, you should see the results. 
Yes, so the we have 80% um, of people on the call um, are not a resident or business owner in the village. And 90% uh, of folks on the call feel that um, shoreline change is the most serious issue followed by um, sea level rise at 85% and flooding at 60% and only 10% of people don't know. So that's great. Um, so we're gonna move on now. Thank you for responding. We're gonna have some more of those polls through the discussion. So um, Dan, would you like to? Yes, um, Nate, I still see the uh, poll by the way on the slide, so. Okay. I don't know if that's just me or. It should be gone now, Dan, is it gone? All right, I think I just, that might just be me. I think it is just you. I can see village coastal risks. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is Dan Stapleton again. And uh, the following slides are gonna provide a brief overview of the village's coastal flood risks. And I think people's perception from that survey are pretty spot on and we'll provide some detail to that. But the principal coastal risks are, you know, really associated with impacts from coastal flooding and from shoreline change. And there's detailed background about the coastal hazards that are presented in the, in the two video presentations. And so we don't really have time in this workshop to go through that, but, but those uh, presentations uh, in total are about an hour. And I think for those interested, you can see um, quite a bit about the, the detailed background. Um, we're also gonna discuss the risks in, um, in the CARP report. So next image, please. So this image overlays of flood inundation limits and identifies impacted roadways. So the first sort of major risk category we're gonna look at is, is your transportation system as it relates to roadways. And about 11 miles of roadway are potentially impacted during the 100 year recurrence interval flood. Now that's a storm similar to uh, the hurricane of 1938 if that were to occur today. So nuisance flooding, you know, such as occurs say during high astronomical events is not expected to be a concern. Uh, it's not a concern now and it's not a concern in the near future. However, roadway flooding during coastal storms is, is a significant risk and can impact access to properties and provision of emergency response services. Most of the flooded roads shown here uh, that are highlighted here are secondary roads and they're in the vicinity of the ponds and associated drainage areas. Montauk Highway, Route 27, is a key travel route, and it's also a village evacuation route. Portions of Route 27 are vulnerable to extreme uh, coastal storm flooding. So overall, there's, there's a, a moderate risk in particular because of the potential effect um, on emergency response capabilities. Next slide. So moving over to a, a, a uh, different category, which is is looking at the potential population and property risk associated with flooding. So there are about 2,229 tax parcels, about 3,000 buildings located within the village. Uh, very high property value. So total property value based on tax records of close to $8 billion. And this includes uh, total building values of about 7.1 billion. Um, about 8% of the Village population lives within the FEMA coastal flood hazard zone. About 350 buildings are located within FEMA coastal flood hazard zones. And that, that represents about 12% of the total uh, number of village buildings. These include about 80 buildings, which are located in what's a, called the FEMA coastal high hazard zone, a VE zone. And that's a zone associated with large wave effects. And that represents about 3% of the, the total number of buildings, but about 12% of the total building value. There are about 400 national flood insurance plan policies within the village. Um, since the inception of the national flood insurance program, there have been about 70 paid claims, totaling about 1.2 million. There have been about four repetitive loss properties. So these are properties that have made um, multiple claims um, and uh, the recent um, updated county natural hazard mitigation plans identified about 30 at-risk properties. So four repetitive loss and about a 30 total at-risk properties. 
Now, note that there has not been a significantly impactful flood event, uh, such as a hurricane in 1938 since the National Flood Insurance Program was established. So the historical claims that the village has experienced likely underestimate the overall flood risk. Increased flood inundation risk in the future is predominantly due to the increase in flood frequency of village areas that are now characterized as 500 year recurrence interval event. Those are sort of in the brown in this image. Uh, those are gonna to increase to a frequency of about 100 year flood risk over the next 10 to 20 years. And that's gonna result in deeper flood water depths within existing flood zones as storm surge and wave heights increase. And that increase in risk is, is due uh, completely uh, due to increasing sea level rise. Next image, please. So Dewberry Consultants completed a draft study which evaluates historical shoreline change uh, as well as the potential future shoreline change associated with sea level rise. And in general, of the village's approximately 4.2 miles of ocean shoreline, about half of that, or about two miles, is indicated to be uh, in retreat. And that's based on observed shorelines between 1983 and 2016. And this, er this erosion results in several village coastal vulnerabilities, including beach erosion, which can result in loss of recreational beach use and loss of habitat, increased dune erosion, since reduced beach width results in greater storm surge and wave effects along the dune line, erosion of land supporting structures, loss of private and public land, the Atlantic double dunes habitat areas predicted to be significantly impacted as shoreline retreat increases with sea level rise and um, there's a potential for a breach at Hook Pond during a extreme storm event. Next slide. So during coastal storms, the storm surge and waves erode the base of the dune. That can cause an instability of the dune, a dune failure, and possibly landward recession at the top of the dune. So there are about 378 parcels plus or minus that are located within an active beach erosion area. New York State has established sea level rise projections indicating a likely sea level rise of about, about one foot to about 1.8 feet by the year 2050. Sea level rise will increase the rate of shoreline erosion. About 98 parcels are located within shoreline areas predicted to have significant shoreline change by 2050. Landward shoreline retreat is predicted to range from about 100 feet to 350 feet with an average of about 245 feet along the village shoreline. Uh, eight existing structure footprints are located within predicted 2050 shorelines indicating the potential for structural failure. Next slide. So just pulling all these together, um, and, and characterizing the, the overall risk, we would say for the village, it's, it's kind of a low to moderate risk. Flood inundation, we know that the property damage risk level is relatively low, uh, except that it flooding ocean shorelines. Roadway flooding is a low to moderate risk. We talked about that. Essential services, these are police, fire, um, including the emergency center facilities. That risk level overall is, is low but we do know a uh, concern about evacuation emergency response uh, limitations due to flooded roads during extreme storms. And we've identified the roadways that would be associated with that. Uh, lifeline facilities, these are power, uh, water, communications. The risk level for that, for the relative to the village are low. Um, we do know, you know the, the village draws its water supply primarily from wells, which are in the glacial outwash deposits and uh, over long-term um, sea level rise effects, you can increase the salt intrusion on some of those supplies. So not immediate concern, but something that you know could be over the very long term. Historic district, districts, low level risk. Uh, pond and marsh, relatively low level risk. And these are risks associated with increasing sea levels, which will change habitat within the ponds and marsh. Right now, that risk is predicted to be low. So those are sort of the overall flood inundation risks. The shoreline risk, however, is high. And that's due to the uh, potential beach erosion and dune erosion. You know, we noted that results in loss of land, loss of natural resources, 
uh, property development, development and property damage. So the shoreline change is, is ranked as high. Nate, that uh, concludes the uh, presentation of village coastal risks. So we have another um, set of questions for you all. Um, if you would take a moment to, to complete them, it would be very helpful. So these respond to the what you just heard about risks. The first is, um, you know, do you think that the village should take action now to um, improve coastal resilience, and mitigate the effects of coastal flooding and shoreline change? Um, and then which coastal risks uh, do you think are the most important? And if you could all take a moment to respond, that would be very helpful. Yeah. And to see all the options on, on question two, you're probably going to have to scroll down. Um, so if you don't see a button to submit the poll, it's because you need to scroll down to the bottom. Mm -hmm. And while you're completing those questions, um, as a reminder for the rest of the, the workshop, um, we're going to have a very limited amount of time to answer questions at the end of this presentation, um, but feel free to, to send questions through the chat box to Dylan Sussman, um, and we're going to compile those questions and uh, do our best to respond, um, at least through our work in the report for this project, if we don't get a chance to answer your question at the end of this presentation. Give you another 20 seconds to finish up. All right, and I'm going to close the poll now. Great, so thank you for your responses on that. Um, I'm gonna move along to the next section on strategies and measures. So um, in this section, we're gonna talk about some, some strategies that the village can use to build resilience and then some um, more specific measures that could support um, those resilient strategies. In the broadest sense, there are three generally recognized um, resilience or adaptation strategies. And you've heard us, if you've attended other, other um, workshops, you've, you've heard us speak about these before. Um, the first is an accommodate strategy. And this strategy is allowing flood water in, but um, protecting locally um, infrastructure, property, and natural resources from damage through permanent or interim measures on an ongoing basis. So a good example of that is raising buildings, which you're familiar, familiar with. You elevate a building, you're getting those uses up out of the flood water, but still allowing the flood, um, assuming that that flood it may happen, um, but limiting the, the, the damage associated with that flooding. Also in this category are, are smaller scale protection strategies, say putting um, a revetment at an individual property or deploying a uh, either a deployable or a permanent flood barrier around a property or several properties to limit flooding. That's in contrast to the second strategy, which is a protect strategy. This is really a much larger scale intervention usually associated with a municipal area or a, a region. Um, and they tend to be interventions that are, are the idea is to keep floods out. Um, so through, say, a, a ring levy around an entire municipality or, or region or um, a seawall around a city or a large tide gate or flood gate that um, keeps the storm surge out of a city. Um, and this is a strategy, as we'll talk about, that we, we do not think is, is really, you don't see it for lower density communities. We don't think it's, it's particularly feasible for um, 
the village. So we're not going to really dwell on that strategy today. The third strategy is manage retreat. And so this, this strategy is, is a, a, an approach that <clears throat> tries to manage um, or make sort of a, a rational, logical, and, and smooth process of withdrawing from vulnerable coastal areas that are subject to flooding so that those properties and uses are no longer at risk. And it tend, generally tends to be over a little bit longer um, term and is supported by um, and, and implemented through uh, land use regulations primarily. So within those broader strategies, there also are a number of, of different specific measures that help to um, implement or support those strategies. And those measures fall into three other categories um, that you could think about. There are um, non-structural measures, such as plans, policies, regulatory compliance, land use, insurance, um, emergency preparedness. There are structural measures um, that are uh, physical, uh, human-made structures like seawalls, levees, revetments, groins, breakwaters. And then there are natural nature-based solutions um, that really combine work with, with nature, work with vegetation to um, limit, limit damage or, or stabilize slopes, things like that. Um, for this area, since we're not thinking about that protection strategy, really not focusing on that, don't think that's feasible, we're going to really not talk, spend a lot of time talking about ring levees or massive seawalls um, or storm surge barrier, barriers. But in orange are some of the measures that we think are you know, plausible for consideration um, for the village for your resilience strategies going forward. And within these, um, as we mentioned, there are those sort of um, non-structural sort of planning type approaches, but there are also some project-based um, measures. So such as elevating a roadway or doing beach nourishment to, to supply more sand to beaches to keep them wide or doing bluff or dune stabilization. And those projects really require um, funding. And so a key question is, is how the village is going to pay for those, the, what can be quite costly as project-based um, resilience measures. So taking a step back, we're gonna launch another poll now. Um, so thinking about planning goals and strategies, we wanna hear from you. Um, what sorts of, of measures, um, we have got a list here of some things that we're thinking about, would you support um, or for the village to focus its resilience planning efforts on? So limiting development, redevelopment of vulnerable areas, elevating new and improved structures to reflect sea level rise, improving emergency response and evacuation, improving post-disaster recovery plans, greater participation in federal state resilience programs, maintaining village recreational beaches, maintaining or creating new erosion control structures, preserving natural resources, including the Atlantic double dunes. Um, so if you can get started answering that question, that would be, I know that's a lot of content there, um, but just wanna get your first reaction to what, which of these sorts of, of measures you would be in favor of and, and which ones do you have questions about or, or definitely wouldn't support um, and so you can select multiple of these answers. And then secondly, which of um, general strategy or strategies would you support in a managed retreat or an accommodate strategy for the village? And you could choose both if you'd like.
I know this is a lot to, to read through, um, but we're going to give you another 30 seconds to try and finish it up. All right, I'm going to close the poll now. And I think we'll, we're going to um, hold off on sharing these results towards the end. So we have one more question for you before we move on. So this is, I mentioned projects and funding. So um, for some of those project-based measures, uh, a key question is who's going to bear the cost of, of that of those measures. So um, is that going to be uh, borne by the community as a whole through taxes, or is it going to be something that um, is going to be, Nate, be those were in the last poll. So they've already answered that question. Oh, they have. Okay, great. Yep. Awesome. Well, then thank you for answering those as well. Um, and the answer to number one was yes, 100%. Awesome. So, and the answer to the second question appears like the, the, the winner out of the, the list was creating an erosion control tax district within the village. So that's pretty interesting. And then there are some runner ups as well. So thank you for that. Um, so the next thing we're gonna talk about is, is really going pretty deep into your local regulation. So bear, bear with me, this is gonna get pretty complex, um, but we just wanna give you um, so a chance to weigh in on, on some specifics and get you a sense of, of what we're thinking about. So um, to start with, uh, I mentioned flooding earlier in the presentation, the, the, in particular, um, some of the recommendations from the Community Risk and Resilience Act. Um, you do have, uh, as you likely know, local flood regulations that build on the state and international building code. Um, and uh, for those of you that live next to the coast, you probably are somewhat familiar with the idea of a base flood elevation and FEMA flood zones. Um, <clears throat> specifically in the village, um, the, the, that you can find what, whether you're, what flood zone you're in on a FEMA um, firm rate map and in those different areas, there's base flood elevations that are established. And the point of the base flood elevation is it is for new construction or substantially um, altered construction, the floor of the first floor, occupiable floor, needs to be at or above that base flood elevation. And locally, there's also an additional two foot freeboard requirement. So that, that first floor needs to be two feet above the base flood elevation um, for the zone that you're in from the established by um, FEMA. And then in um, coastal high hazard areas where there's a lot of wave action, there are specific requirements for the, that lower area below the first floor um, to limit damage from waves going through. Um, and then there's also local um, restrictions on the building height. And so together, the um, base flood elevation requirements in local zoning and the height requirements create this envelope within which new development um, or new uh, a building occupiable, occupiable uses can be located. Now, according to the state recommendations, um, they suggest incorporating a medium sea level rise amount into the base flood elevation within your local zoning regulations that would mean that that buildings that um, would today have to meet two feet freeboard requirement above the base flood elevation would um, if if you were to pursue that kind of, of of resilience measure would have to also account for the amount of sea level rise that's a, a, that is predicted in sort of a medium highest probability scenario <clears throat> so 
So this will launch another poll for you, um, kind of a, a quiz on whether what, what you got out of that in your opinion. So um, would you be in favor of increasing the base flood elevation requirement for structures to anticipate sea level rise in the manner that I, I described? Um, and would you be in favor of or support changing zoning um, or tweaking zoning height restrictions so as to allow that kind of elevation of, of buildings to incorporate sea level rise. And then an additional idea um, would be um, to add some additional overlay zones to potentially limit or guide um, development within areas that might be um, at risk from flooding because of that medium risk sea level rise. So that would be a, a slightly different approach to the uh, to dealing with sea level rise and flooding. I think that um, since you, and then there's a couple other questions that are going to be um, most relevant as I move ahead in the presentation, but it's fine. You can give ahead, give go ahead and, and give your your first impression of those, um, and I'll get into those uh, more in, in a moment. Dylan, you think we could leave the poll up while I advance through the next section? Sure, and if, if the poll is getting in your way, you can grab that um, poll box and click on it and drag it out of the way. Great. So as you're working on that, I'm gonna keep, go, keep going. So the next piece, I wanna talk about some local regulations and um, some, uh, some state uh, regulations that are administered locally that both have to do with um, the, and, and play a critical role in shaping the way that um, properties are developed or redeveloped um, in the most the areas most vulnerable to coastal erosion. So the first of these is a local um, dune preservation setback rule that's in the village. Um, and so that's chapter 124. And this is an older bylaw that is really focused, as the name suggests, on uh, pretty squarely on, on, on protecting the natural resource of the dunes in the community. And <clears throat> it's defined differently west, on the western side of the village from the eastern side. And in both cases, this local dune preservation setback um, starts with the mean high water mark, which is further defined as the southerly edge of beach grass um, at the dunes, and then also relates to a, a contour, which differs from the western portion of the community to the eastern side, um, but that, that contour is, is measured as an elevation above the mean high water line or edge of beach grass. And from that contour line, there is a setback distance of 100 feet where buildings and structures are prohibited according to the existing um, dune preservation setbacks bylaw. And then there's another area that overlaps that 100 foot area in many places um, that is a 150 foot setback from the mean high water mark or southerly edge of beach grass where no disturbance um, is the intent so that that is more restrictive than the building and structure prohibited area um, and includes uh, a, you know prohibited prohibition on on new homes as well as some additional restrictions on changes to um, the the dune grading and things of that nature so then in addition to that local bylaw which is a little older there's also a state program called the Coastal Erosion Management Program that has a coastal erosion hazard area permit program, which is locally administered by the village. The purpose of this um, 
regulation is overlaps with that of the dune preservation um, bylaw. And, but this one is, it has a little bit different focus. So it, this in the coastal erosion hazard area regulations, um, the intent is to, um, in, in, to regulate air structures, keep them away from um, those dunes with the, the idea of, of um, sorry, regulating coastal areas subject to coastal flooding and erosion to minimize or prevent damage or destruction to man-made property, natural protective features, natural resources, and to protect human life. And so even though natural resources are within that statement, it really, this, this is really focused a little bit more on protecting property and, and um, health, safety, welfare. <clears throat> now, these coastal erosion hazard areas are further divided, if you weren't, um, you know, if this wasn't complex enough to this point, are further divided into two different areas, natural protective feature areas and structural hazard areas. So a natural protective feature area is an area mapped by the state um, that f falls within various categories of, of natural resource, so dunes, bluffs, beaches and includes 25 feet landward from the toe of the dune, say, within a natural protective feature area that has um, requirements for different construction activities. You have to get a permit through um, the Coastal Erosion Hazard Area Permitting Program, and certain actions are prohibited. Um, namely, new construction is, is um, not allowed in that natural protective feature area. And then some areas within the, the coastline that are subject to higher erosion, so greater than one foot or more per year of, of shoreline change, are designated as structural hazard areas. And these are mapped by the state again. Um, and in this case, that boundary of regulated area is wider and varies based on the historical erosion rate for that given area. And this these regulated areas are mapped. There's a, currently a map you can find online for your community. And the, the state is currently in the process of revising these maps um, to, to redefine what those um, natural protective feature area and structural hazard areas are. And locally, if you disagree with that state mapping, there are a couple opportunities for appeals, but just, just really two. One is to disagree with a long-term average annual rate of shoreline recession so the shoreline change rate, if, it, if you think it was incorrectly established, or if the area was a just erroneously identified as a dune, say. Here you can see an actual section through the beach in um, the village. And um, the, that natural protective feature area is here, um, would be the, the dune in for a dune natural protective feature area, and 25 feet from the landward toe of that dune. And then in an area where there's greater than one foot per year shoreline change or recession, that area would be a structural hazard area and you'd have an additional width to that regulated area um, that varies based on the shoreline change rate. So putting those things together on a typical site in the village um, you can see in this diagram, this is an example of, of the existing conditions on the western half of the village. Um, line A would be that regulatory contour line from your local dune um, preservation setback bylaw. Um, so that's 15 feet above the mean high water or um, seaward line of vegetation. And then 100 feet from that item B on this section is a no build area. And then in orange, item C, there's a, that 150 foot setback from the mean high water mark, where, which has a more restrictive no disturbance area. And then over all of that is um, the state natural protective feature area for dunes. And that has still another line that you can find on the map that it, most current map that was established by the state. And as you might imagine, that's kind of messy, um, and there's that adds a lot of complexity um, when for new projects that are are um, in the works or or to understand as a property owner, you know how those interact and what you can and can't do. On the eastern side of the village, um, 
you have the Atlantic double dune. So there's a really different geographic um, setting. And, and for that reason, the village local dune preservation setback is defined differently. In this case, line A, that regulatory contour line above mean high water is back here typically on a typical lot. And there's only a 20, because it's there's already that um, width of the Atlantic double dune area that is um, within the, the uh, kind of seaward of that contour line, there's only a 25 foot wide no build area. And in this case, the no disturbance area starts at that contour line and goes um, out through the dunes. But in this case, the, co the state coastal erosion hazard area line actually tracks here along the primary dune. So you can look up online the particular regulations for your state structural hazard area, natural protective feature areas. But the gist is the structural hazard areas are um, more restrictive and the intent is that to prevent um, development in those areas at high risk. Um, and so there's much more strict, um, um, much more restrictive uh, requirements for permitting in that area. And in the natural protective feature area in a, in a dune, um, you're allowed to do more things like maintaining or um, even constructing stone revetments seaward of the dune with a, with a permit from the state. Um, and then in this area though, you're still not, the, in, the intent is not to have new development or major additions to um, existing structures. And there's also near shore areas and beaches, which we're not really not gonna focus on today, but um, have important regulations uh, about what you can and can't do in those areas. So putting that together on the site um, and stepping back um, for a moment, I know that was a lot of detail and apologize for the complexity there. Um, but if you were to think about within the context of these regulations, how one might try to pursue or support either an accommodate strategy or a managed retreat strategy for the village, um, these are some things that you, you that might uh, support one or the other strategy for the village in terms of, of modifications to those local, your local regulations. So say west of Old Beach Lane, which we talked about on the western side of the village, this is the, that existing condition where um, today, really, if, if without, uh, without variances or um, appeals, the area for redevelopment is here behind the natural protective feature area from the state and the 100 foot no build um, area from the local regulation. In a no action scenario, you given the current rate of shoreline recession in some areas, you could have um, a, a scenario like this where the you have a much narrower beach like Dan spoke about earlier in the presentation that starts to uh, you know, greatly reduce the ability to use that as a recreational beach. And then also starts to compromise the revetments and, and dunes adjacent to that beach, which then in turn jeopardizes um, a property. And <clears throat> in, under the current regulations, um, you could maintain that revetment um, with a fairly complex permitting process. Um, and there are some changes that you could make, but in general, you have, um, again, that sort of complex set of, of permitting that I'm sure any yeah. of you, oh, sorry, is there a question? All right, I'll keep moving. Um, yes, no. Nate, you're muted now. All right, so that's the no action scenario. In an accommodate scenario, the goal again would be to accept that flooding will occur, but try to have ongoing measures to limit the damage associated with, with flooding and coastal erosion. So in this case, we would have a, a significant and ongoing investment in beach nourishment to maintain a wider recreational beach, which in turn would help to stabilize the toe of the dune and um, and then within areas with the revetments, you would allow the conti continued maintenance of those revetments and incentivize, um, say, natural or nature-based solutions like 
um, vegetated high or hybrid dune reinforcement um, along the area to, to help keep that protective feature of the dune. And then you might pair that with um, some uh, attempt to streamline or, or make the local regulations um, have a little bit easier relationship to say the state regulations so that there it's a little bit clearer permitting process and um, potentially easier to enforce at the community level and at the property level easier to understand and um, comply with. And then that might also include incentives for within say larger lots for folks that are redeveloping, building a new house to do that um, further from the shoreline and to, to incentivize creation of habitat and create, you know, creation of, of um, those nature based uh, solutions that will help to um, build resilience for that property in the long run. Now, <clears throat> Stepping to the other sort of viable um, or, or at least plausible um, scenario or strategy, the managed retreats strategy, um, this is what that might look like. And a note here, you might have uh, uh, also realized as I was just describing that state coastal erosion hazard area, um, while the structural hazard area is not in itself a managed retreat strategy, um, it's fairly clear that that is the, an approach that does tend to support, um, you know, a man, or would tend to support a managed retreat strategy combined with other elements. So in a managed retreat strategy, um, the idea would be that instead of focusing the, that investment on beach nourishment, you would maybe still provide, still um, do some beach nourishment, but have either no or less beach nourishment. Um, and instead, allow the, the beach and dune to um, migrate naturally um, inland. And then you would need to pair that with pretty strong incentives um, to for existing um, buildings to be re relocated or redeveloped um, landward on say larger lots along with much stronger incentives to do habitat restoration um, and, and that sort of thing at the, the Ocean front and the combination. Um, I think in this one as well, just like in the last example, I think that we, we think that there is some benefit to considering, um, perhaps at the local level, also uh, working on that local bylaw to make it easier to understand, clearer, and perhaps more aligned with the state, um, the way that the state defines dunes within their coastal erosion hazard area regulations. And that's in contrast to an unmanaged retreat, um, which is sort of related to that no action scenario, where you know without that um, care to incentivize redevelopment and, and streamline regulation, you're in a position where you'd still have shoreline erosion, and say um, either because of the state structural hazard area or locally, um, you decided that you didn't want to maintain revetments or um, allow for uh, protection of the toe of the dune. In that case, you would have um, that same migration of the shoreline and dunes um, without the sort of um, preparation uh, or, or uh, effort to make it streamlined so that the redevelopment happens inland and so that you have much greater risk for um, individual property owners and the, and the community in that kind of a scenario. And you still have that, um, you know, the complexity of the existing local bylaws and state permitting um, that, that a local property owner would need to, to get through in order to make changes to their property. And so this is really something that um, most people agree you would want to avoid would be an unmanaged retreat. Um, and so that uh, <clears throat> kind of gives you a sense of, of how those change some potential changes to your so your local regulations and you, and um, participation at, with the, the state as they develop that coastal erosion hazard area um, could play a big role in supporting one strategy or another for resilience in the community. So 
I know that was a lot to get through, but we wanted to, to and, and th these poll questions, I believe, already were up um, earlier, but um, I'm just going to go over them again so you have a chance to, to process what we're, we're thinking about. So um, we are asking you, what types of changes to local regulations would you support to improve the village resilience to shoreline erosion? So that would include incentives for redevelopment and relocation of structures. So you saw that and you know, that's something that could play a role in either strategy. Um, creation of overlay zones to guide development in order to limit shoreline erosion. Um, again, could kind of work either way, but that tends to, is something that would definitely would support a managed retreat strategy. Um, revising the dune setbacks and dune preservation regulation, regulations, just, at the most basic level to just be a little clearer, easier to understand and enforce and, and relate more clearly to the state regulations that overlap. Um, and then maybe making those local regulations more restrictive. Um, and then the last question, what actions should the village take to help shape New York's coastal erosion hazard area uh, permitting program? And that, that you know, you've heard more about that now, but the, the basic pieces there is that things that you could do would be, first of all, um, to <clears throat> make sure that locally people know what this program is and really help to, to spread awareness of the existing regulations and that process of map change that is ongoing. Um, and then maybe investing more at the village level in working directly with the state to the, the extent that that's, uh, feasible and um, to, to play a role or, or at least, you know, have a voice in that process of map change um, that will be ongoing. So um, Dylan, I don't know if there's anyone else, th that poll's closed now, right? Yeah. Yeah, so 20 people answered it, um, which is about the number that answered the other polls. Um, okay. So the results were that 85% of people supported creating overlay zones to guide development in order to limit shoreline erosion. Um, basically, all of those options had a super majority of support. Um, likewise, you know, 80% of people supported the two options under what the village should do to shape New York's coastal erosion hazard area permitting program and inform the public. Um, so pretty strong report for pretty strong, strong support for all of these options. Um, so that's that's where we are. Um, Great. I'm not sure that the questions about flooding ever got launched. I could launch that poll now if we'd like to get the answers on flooding. Um, you know, maybe we could launch those while there are some closing remarks. So this basically concludes the content section of the, the presentation. And, and we just wanted to briefly wrap up um, with some, some closing remarks to just tie things together. And we are running, you know, late, so we'll, as I mentioned earlier, questions you chat in to Dylan, um, we'll try to address through the report. Um, but uh, otherwise, um, maybe uh, Dan or, or Peter, do you wanna um, sort of bring us home while Dylan launches that last poll that we missed? Nate, there were only two questions that came in, so it might be worth just trying to answer them now. Sure. Um, so the first question, which I think is a Dan Stapleton question, is has potential effect of hurricane ebb surge been analyzed? Where are specific flood corridors and inundation areas for various hurricane categories? What is the effect of existing erosion protection structures in EH, VG in relation to shoreline recession and storm damage? Yeah, hi, this is Dan. So um, the, there's uh, several pieces to that question and um, we have a little bit of time here. So let me uh, break them apart a little bit. So one of them is relate, related to flooding associated with different category hurricanes. And yes, we have looked at that. And um, we noted that there are a couple of supporting video presentations that go into the hazards in more technical detail. And within those presentations, we have several slides that look at inundation relative to hurricane categories. Um, and we also relate the FEMA base flood, which is a 100 year recurrence flood. We try and put that in perspective in terms of a hurricane category as well. Um, 
the FEMA flood map is, without going into details on how that was prepared, the primary risk in that is a tropical cyclone risk that's causing the, the flooding. So the hurricane category and the FEMA map actually align quite well. Um, what's the effect of existing erosion protection structures? Uh, I'm not sure what those um, letters refer to, but let me talk about it specifically. So the erosion protection structures that are basically present in the village shoreline are revetments, rock revetments that are relatively low in height and they're embedded in the toe of the dunes. And those are, uh, I believe, constructed in, and managed by the property owners. And they are allowed under the coastal hazard uh, regulations. So, those have been, I think, reasonably effective, although you can see lots of areas where it's, it's eroding um, and, and the sand has to be replaced over the revetment. But I think, you know, for, under the sort of more typical storms, more frequent storms, those are reasonably protective. I think their protective value, though, is going to be uh, significantly diminished if you have a significant coastal flood event, such as a hurricane of 1938, if that were to occur today, or, or, you know, what we would consider like the FEMA 100 year uh, recurrence interval flood. And during that extreme flood event, the, the storm surge and, and something we call wave setup is going to be right at and actually above the height of most of those revetments. So the waves are going to be impacting the, uh, the dune directly. So I think while they've performed well in recent history, um, they their performance under an extreme storm event, such as a 100 year recurrence interval event is going to be very limited. Yeah. And um, there's another question that came in, um, which was, aren't stone revetments prohibited? Um, and uh, feel free to some, you know, anyone else wants to jump in. Uh, my understanding is that um, that they aren't outright prohibited um, on the common aid, but there are local and state uh, regulation, permitting regulations that make them um, the, very restrictive in terms of what could be um, built. And, um, and so my, my understanding, such as it is, is that locally uh, one could build a or a revetment if it was at the seaward toe of a dune and it was demonstrated that that revetment did not disrupt or did not uh, prevent movement of free movement of sediment between the dune and the beach which is um, certainly a challenge uh, and maybe Dan could speak more to that but um, then at the state level there's the permitting if you're in a natural protective feature area my understanding is that the revetments are allowed with a permit. So you would have to apply for a permit and it would be at the discretion of the state to grant that permit or not. And that in general, the state and, um, and, your, and locally, um, along with the general coastal science and coastal management community, uh, very much it frowns upon hard structures uh, because they do uh, exacerbate erosion locally. So that's that's my understanding of that. Yeah, and I would just add to that, the, you know, the implementation of that is a little different in the village than it is in the town of East Hampton. And um, that's why we see actually uh, quite a bit of the use of these tow revetments at the dune tow within the village. Nate, maybe you could stop sharing so then we could. Yeah. Could see if anybody wants to uh, raise their hand. I think that we've reached the end of our time, of course. We really appreciate your, your coming today. Um, Sam or Kim, is there anything you wanted to say uh, to wrap up? And, and if anyone has anything they'd like to share, please uh, raise your hand, I guess, and we can call on you. If people do have questions um, after this uh, presentation, 
you can definitely send them to Samantha and we'll forward them to you guys or answer them the best we can and then share with the group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did have um, just a couple of final thoughts here for the village that um, when Nate was going through the coastal uh, erosion, the state regulations, you could see the opportunities for appeal. And there are two opportunities, one of the recession rates and one is the determination of the natural protection feature. And the state is, is doing that remapping now and I think it would be a sort of a good objective for the village to see to, you know, to what extent they can to maybe participate in, in that process a little bit um, to sort of create a, a solid basis going forward in terms of responding to those appeals. Uh, I will note that the company that did the, uh, Duberry that did the, the shoreline analysis that we presented here, I believe is also helping the state with developing those recession rates for that purpose. So um, you can see a future here where uh, every property development is gonna be an appeal. So what you can do to kind of head that off now um, would, be, would be good. Yes, uh, Billy, you're muted. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, my interaction with folks at the state has been that they've already formulated the maps and they're just waiting, I guess, for the new maps to be approved by the governor, which I guess he, they've been sat on for over a year now. So I don't know how much interaction, if, unless they're redrafting the maps again, mm -hmm. I'm not sure how much opportunity exists for us to um, insert ourselves in the, re unless they're remapping again, I don't know. But my, my understanding was that they've actually drafted the maps well over a year ago and they're just sitting um, yeah, I think that's steps. correct. So I wasn't really trying to imply that you'd you know jump in and start changing the the line. Okay. But I I think that you know really having a clear understanding of how that was developed. Um, so you could I guess what I'm what I can see is just a lot of appeals, an endless process of appeals. So you know, whatever you could do to sort of establish that basis really early on and get some consensus. I think okay. Good. Understood. Thank you. I think dovetailing with that, I wonder, you know, if, if you all have thought through how you might um, spread the word once those maps come out, you know, and I think that, you know, an opportunity there is to figure out a, a way of, of making sure that everybody in the village that needs to know about those maps does and, you know, that it's clear what, what happened and why. Um, seems like would be a benefit. All right. So just to close the loop, those final poll results are up and probably blocking your screen. Um, so 100% of you supported creating over development, reconstruction and future floodplain areas. 64% supported increasing the base flood elevation and only 36% supported revising the height limit. Um, so that's pretty clear indication that there's desire um, to not allow future development of those areas. But as with everything, um, it's important to remember that here, the people in this meeting are a small subset of the community. Mm -hmm. so not a scientific poll. <laughs> One thing I'd like to say, um, and Billy probably knows this better than anyone, uh, people that buy a $30 million lot on the ocean don't like to be told what they can and can't do with it. You know, so, I mean, it's going to be a process, an educational process for us to get them to understand why this is in their interest. Um, you know, it, it's hard. Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, everything that we presented here would indicate that if you were going to redevelop one of those lots, you want the house pretty far in London, have a nice uh, naturally preserved dune along the, along the waterfront. But, you know, 
for that kind of money, people want to have the water view right from from their house. So it is a um, it is it is a challenge. Has has there been a look at the uh, lots along the waterfront in the village to uh, see how many uh, uh, lots are amenable to moving? Uh, back or redeveloping in case of uh, the water view moving into the living room? Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't do, a, you know, we didn't identify lo lots that are sort of currently undeveloped. So they would be, you know, an opportunity to do that with the new development going forward. We did look at the number of lots and buildings that are currently within the, you know, what we would characterize as an erosion zone. And I think the problem will be, you know, much greater uh, in the future because the effect of sea level rise, and we can see this in the Dewberry analysis, the effect of sea level rise is to significantly um, change those historical recession rates and, you know, the, the risk of a dune failure is going to go up significantly uh, in the future with sea level rise and, and probably sooner than later. And it, and it won't be a sort of chronic condition where it just becomes apparent. It'll be uh, an episodic condition where you do in fact have some very large storms and those, each of those storms are, are capable of doing that type of dune erosion. And I think under that case, some of those existing houses will be undermined just based on their location today. So, um, I think we did enough to, to understand the, the risk, uh, but the solution in terms of the types of things Nate showed, which, you know, just Arthur brought that up. I mean, it's a challenge. A lot of these are de developed parcels, very expensive properties, very expensive homes on those properties. And, um, you know, I don't see anybody picking those up and moving them at this point. So. Oh, you're on mute. You're muted. Am I unmuted? No? That's good. Okay, great. Great job. I think it, you really did a wonderful job explaining the complex levels of regulations that exist. And uh, Billy could add to it of the hours of hearings about how the lawyers on both sides have parsed this and, and what everybody has done to kind of navigate their way through it. My impression, and, and Billy can help me co you know, correct this, is that you're dealing with mostly an already built out environment, right? I don't know that there's too many vacant lots that are left to be built. And um, so, and many of them, I don't know what the percentage of are, are already in a pre-existing non-conforming condition with relation to some of these regulations here. So in order to give an incentive for somebody to relocate, they're gonna have to go back to further back and be on lower ground. And then the oceanfront property owners is gonna say, wait, I spent all this money to see the ocean and I can't see it anymore. I would move back, but you have to allow me to go higher. And I, I, I think that's what kind of people are asking for. I don't know that the village, um, I don't know whether they've had any real life experiences where they've done that, where they've granted a height variance in order to still allow the, the view. But I mean, I think that's a trade-off and, and I think the people need to think about whether that would be acceptable um, rather than just say no, because otherwise people just aren't going to, they might not move. They're going to just stay built into the dune or in a place that's not safe for everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Alicia, you said that, said that really well, and that's exactly the situation. Um, you know, I think the incentive is really going to be actual damage to these properties. And that's just a, a you know, question of probability when that occurs, but the likelihood of it occurring, at least within, you know, now in the 2050s is for some of those properties is probably fairly high. I, I will say I was a little surprised by the survey results if I got them correctly as far as changing the height uh, zoning. That was pretty low, a low score if I, if I got that right, Nate, is that correct? It's like 36% or something. Yeah, it was very low, it was 36%.
Yeah, that is interesting. I think that part of the reason that this it was so low on raising the height requirements is that the effect that that has on the land properties of the oceanfront lot. You know, I don't think there's any appetite for making something less attractive. And that's kind of where that comes from. I know we have one application um, before our ZBA, uh, Billy could address this better than I, um, that they, since they have to move back, they're going to lose their view and they want to raise the house. Yeah, just to add to that, and that, that's a situation where they, they opted to just renovate and expand their existing residence versus moving it to a more conforming location. So, <clears throat> well, all right. It looks like our discussion has come to an appropriate conclusion. Uh, Sam, is there anything you want to say to wrap up or uh, give no. a benediction? <laughs> yeah, thank you all for participating and thank you guys for doing a great job on this presentation and meeting. Um, yeah, thank you to everyone that stayed on and was active in participating in those survey questions. And if you come up with anything after the fact, you can feel free to reach out to us. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. Thank you all for coming. See you next time. Thank you. Thanks very much. This was great. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>